So how do we make decisions? Well, at a high level, we start with facts, things, things we know or at least believe to be true. And then we somehow combine them together to make inferences. It's that somehow that we're going to be talking about today. One method we all use is called inductive reasoning. Right. With this approach, you look at evidence, for example, your experience with what's happened in the past, and you use it to draw a conclusion about what's going to happen in the future. Right. For example, in this scenario, you see the clouds. I'm looking out my window. It's cloudy outside right now. And you automatically associate them with rain. You know it's possible that it won't rain, but your past experience tells you that the clouds often precede rain, so based on that experience, you grab your umbrella. Now, I have a similar situation here in Florida where I live. We're, we're in the subtropics and close to the water, so the afternoons usually see some rain. So based on my years of experience with the summer weather, I always have an umbrella in the back of my car, even if the sky is clear when I walk out the door in the morning. Now, here you can see one of the pitfalls of inductive reasoning. 3,000 years of past experience tells us that asteroids don't hit the Earth, at least not ones of significant size. Now, inductive reasoning could lead you to believe that an asteroid would never hit the Earth again. It's not an entirely unreasonable conclusion, but it ignores the additional fact that asteroid events are exceedingly rare. So while our data is valid, it's possible that we're just looking at things on the wrong time scale. So this scenario is an example of what's called the black swan fallacy. For decades, people believed that black swans didn't exist because they'd never seen one until one was finally discovered. And the issue wasn't that they didn't exist, it was just that they are exceptionally rare. Now, I'm not saying this is a way of arguing that deductive reasoning is invalid, right? People use it every day to get perfectly valid results. I'm offering these examples just, just as a warning that while inductive reasoning is a practical tool, it has its limitations. And like any tool, the person using it needs to be aware of them. So I've, I've got an example here of a situation where you can apply inductive reasoning to come up with a conclusion. So I, I want you to take a minute to think about this, using maybe some of the methods that we discussed in the, in the previous lectures, and see if you can come up with a general conclusion. Okay, so this is a situation where I would start by looking at some specific examples, right? Trying, trying to build up that history, right? That, that weather history, for example, that I was talking about on the previous slides. So I'm, I'm going to pick two odd numbers. Let's take three and five, and I'll add them together, and I get eight. Okay, I mean, that's just one point, right? Not much to go on yet. Let, let's try another one. Let's do seven plus one. If I add those together, I get eight. Okay, that's interesting. I got the same number both times. Well, I don't think that's always going to happen. Let, let's, let's try something else. So maybe, maybe I just picked weird, right? Let's do um, 12. Oh, sorry, that's even. I know what odd numbers are. Let's do 11 plus five. Okay, and then they see now I got something different, right? Good. Okay, it's 16. But I, I am kind of starting to see a pattern here, right? When, when you're doing this, you, uh, I'm looking at those results and I'm asking myself, what do they all have in common? Right? The one thing I'm noticing, they're all even numbers. Okay, so this is actually kind of how mathematical research starts. We, we look at some examples. And we think, okay, maybe, maybe I'm seeing a pattern here. All right, so what, what I would do next, again, approaching this kind of like a mathematician, I would say, well, look, the numbers I picked first we're all positive. Okay, so let, let me try some negative numbers. Right, let's try some negative numbers and see what happens. Let's say I picked negative five plus negative nine. Okay, that's negative 14. Well, okay, good, pattern's still holding, right? It's also uh, uh, also even. How about, how about if I mix them up? How about if I do negative five plus positive nine, right? See, I'm looking at another case. I've done all positive, I've done all negative. Now I'm doing a mixture of the two. Well, that's four, right? So yeah, it's, it's looking good, right? So the next thing I would do, 
again, thinking of this as a math process, well, maybe maybe it only works for kind of smallish numbers. Let me try a really big number. Let me try um, 10,001 plus 10,003. Right? If I add those together, I get 20,004. Look at that. It's even. Right? Every every example I've tried, and, I, and I've tried several here, right? And I, from a, from a bunch of different situations. So here I, I would be inclined to take my dedu to take my inductive reasoning approach and say my conclusion is the sum of two odd numbers is an even number. Okay, so that's inductive reasoning. There is another kind. Right? Deductive reasoning, on the other hand, is more about absolutes. It starts with things you accept as facts. Things that you have every reason to believe are always true. And from there you draw your conclusion. Right, this form of reasoning is the bread and butter of mathematicians. Right, we we're not we're not looking for a, a few examples. We're 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 a very absolute kind of people. We want always. Right now, while mathematicians, right, this is the bread and butter of of our approach to reasoning. It also gets used on a daily basis in many ways outside of mathematics as well. Consider this example. Where our rain example started with general rules, ones that were true as far as we could see, deductive reasoning starts with something that we can reasonably believe is always true. In this case, the garbage is picked up every Thursday. Right? The garbage collection people have committed to this. If we combine that with the second fact that today is Thursday, again, not something that's open to Opinion. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Sometimes it's Thursday. No, I know for certain that today is Thursday. From these two facts, I can conclude deductively that the garbage will be picked up before the day is out. So the key difference here is our level of confidence in our assumptions. In inductive reasoning, our conclusions are based on trends or past behaviors. With deductive reasoning, we're basing our conclusion on facts that were certain are correct. So in a professional setting, deductive reasoning is the cornerstone of mathematics, where inductive reasoning is the stock and trade of the sciences. And this quote from Einstein sums up the different approaches. Science is based on evidence, experimental results. Once the body of evidence reaches a tipping point without any sign of contradiction, Scientists accept the results as being valid and go forward from there. But as Einstein says here, they are aware that their conclusions are always subject to review. They're always subject to reevaluation based on newly discovered facts. Right? Einstein himself did this for, for centuries. Newton's laws of, of, of motion were the cornerstone of physics. And then Einstein came along. And he said, okay, wait a minute, look at this, right? And, and Einstein showed that Newton's, Newton's laws were great where they applied, but that, that they only really worked for situations where objects first weren't moving very fast and second weren't very heavy. When, you got, when things started going really fast and we got up around the speed of light, Newton's laws started to fall apart. And so Einstein himself kind of illustrated this with his work. Now, for a mathematician, a preponderance of evidence is insufficient. We're always concerned that despite all the examples we've checked, like the ones in the odd number example, maybe there's one bizarre special case lurking out there that we just haven't noticed yet. All right, so from a practical perspective, both methods of argument are equally useful. As long as, you know, as I said previously, uh, you're aware of each one's potential pitfalls.